Foundation will be 50 years old. And we all want to be celebrating that anniversary, knowing that the life-saving promise of vaccines is a reality for everyone. From the launch of EPI on May 23rd of 1974 at the 27th World Health Assembly until well into the first decade of the 2000s, global vaccination coverage increased. New vaccines were introduced in countries around the world at a rapid pace, and the gap in the breadth of protection between rich and less resourced countries was narrowing at a steady but a remarkable pace. However, in the past decade, along with a plateau in progress, it became starkly evident that within many countries, there are major inequities in vaccination coverage, with whole communities left out, even while coverage was high in other parts of the country. And during this period, some countries saw remarkable progress and others had major challenges in their program and were unable to sustain previous coverage levels falling backwards to levels not seen in those countries for many years and driven by many factors, economic, social, conflict, trust, misinformation, and more. And then suddenly came the pandemic. Countries struggled to protect themselves from the impacts of COVID while also trying to maintain essential immunization programs. In 2021 alone, the number of zero-dose children, those kids who don't receive even a single dose of vaccine through the routine program, was almost 40% higher than those in 2019. And that increase in left out children was largely the result of the pandemic. So 2023 is a really pivotal year for immunization. Our actions now will set the stage for recovery or for further loss of progress. A lot is at stake. Polio eradication is at stake, lives of children, the future of girls, and the well-being of communities around the world. I'm sure the Director General and others will speak about the big catch-up, which we've launched with immunization partners around the world to ignite this recovery and strengthening. In the past few months, I've had the great joy and honor to be in Mozambique, to be in Kenya, to be in Zambia, and have seen on the ground the country commitment to catching up crucial political leadership, innovation, digital tools, problem solving, especially community ownership and investment. So we really look forward to hearing from our esteemed panelists how all stakeholders, global, national, and local, are involved in efforts to catch up, to restore, and to strengthen immunization, and to rebuild stronger primary health care services in every community and in every country. I now have the great privilege to introduce our moderator, Ms. Renee Gamo, from Kenya and the UK. She's a corporate lawyer, a business leadership coach, and an award-winning broadcaster and acclaimed former radio host. We're honored to have her moderate this exciting roundtable on immunization. Over to you, Renee. Thank you very much, Dr. Crato O'Brien, and welcome to all of the delegates to this conversation. You've referenced the numbers, 25 million children unvaccinated or undervaccinated, 18.2 million of which have not been vaccinated at all. And we can see the results in the breakdowns of multiple, breakouts of multiple preventable diseases that were previously thought to be in the past. So how do we create a future that is different from the present that we are experiencing? Well, to introduce this subject, none other than our Director General, Dr. Tedros. Dr. Tedros, I've been listening to you throughout the course of the week as you spoke of five core areas that you identified. Collaborative surveillance, you said, community protection, safe and scalable clinical care, access to countermeasures, emergency coordination. We were listening. And I'd like to add one more and suggest from a completely non-professional, certainly within the health space, but a person who works very cleanly with communities which is effective and inclusive and collaborative communication, putting on the table those who are not at the table, perhaps even rethinking the table and rethinking the furniture. I don't know. I'm certainly very interested in hearing what the panel will speak about on how we restore essential immunization. And so to you, Your Excellency Dr. Tedros, to make your opening remarks and allow me to say this, that as one of those who pre prior to this 
has only watched and felt the effects of the great work that is done by those on the panel here. I want to really celebrate and acknowledge your leadership at the World Health Organization during what was an unprecedented period in the living history, the recent pandemic. Dr. Tedros, to you. Thank you. Thank you, our moderator, Dr. Rene Gamau. We had another Rene, the soprano, I think, in the opening, our goodwill ambassador, so another Rene. <laughs> Uh, the Honorable Dr. Bikas Devkota, uh, my colleague Dr. Seth Berkeley, Dr. Ubah Farah, Dr. George Mouinia, Dr. Shital Sharma, Dr. Yasin Cholakov, Mr. Andri Kazaku, and my colleague Dr. Kate O'Brien, Excellencies, Honorable Ministers, Ambassadors, Heads of Delegation, dear colleagues and friends. Thank you for joining us today. In my opening remarks on Sunday, I spoke about the incredible power of vaccines which have eradicated smallpox, pushed polio to the brink and made many other ones fear this is easily preventable. Of course, when I spoke about vaccines, you remember also I recognized the leadership uh, of uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Uh, Seth uh, Berkeley. Thank you for your leadership, uh, Seth. In the past two years, we have witnessed the fastest and largest vaccination rollout in history, which has been critical to ending COVID-19 at the global health emergency. We have also taken huge steps towards a new tuberculosis vaccine after decades of stalled progress. And on World Malaria Day, we celebrated the nearly 1.5 million children in Ghana, Kenya, and Malawi who are protected by the new malaria vaccine as part of a pilot-led uh, pilot study led by a pilot led by WHO. But while we recognize our collective achievements, we also need to remain clear-sighted about the consequences of COVID-19 and its impact on protecting children with life-saving immunizations. We estimate that 67 million children missed out on essential vaccines during the pandemic, leaving them at risk of preventable disease. The consequences of this are already being seen and felt across the world, with reports of dozens of outbreaks of measles, cholera, and diphtheria. The effects of missed vaccinations for other vaccine preventable diseases like HPV will take years to be seen and will affect people in the prime of their lives. This sharp decline in essential immunization coverage follows almost a decade of stalled progress, including millions of children who have never received a vaccination at all. To galvanize global action, WHO and our partners in the Immunization Agenda 2030 launched the Big Catch-Up, a year-long effort to get immunization back on track. We're working with countries to support health workers and communities to catch up the children who have missed out on life-saving vaccines. We're also supporting countries to strengthen primary health care systems so they can deliver essential immunizations even in times of crisis. As we will hear shortly, many countries have made remarkable progress, but more remains to be done. Much of the success is due to the hard work of community health workers in getting vaccines to those who need them. We can all learn from the experiences and best practices that will be shared today and take with us a renewed commitment to ensure every child benefits from the life-saving power of vaccines. I thank you, Madam Moderator, and back to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. Well, I think, um, we'll go straight into our panel speakers. The next speaker needs no introduction. 
I noticed today that I had to pull him away from the floor because of the number of selfies that were needed. Believe it or not, you're an actually a health superstar. And so to uh, you, uh, Dr. Seth uh, Berkeley, and your leadership of Gavi, I think needs no commendation greater than the responses that you have seen from the floor. I especially want to celebrate you and honor you, knowing that this might be one of the last kind of public addresses. I know that you have a few more um, in this particular capacity. And so I will ask you, dear audience, that we give him a little bit extra time, perhaps about eight to nine minutes, to really go through the subject matter and give us your reflections. Thank you very much. Should I start or you want to? <laughs> go right ahead. Okay. So first of all, thank you all for that um, generous set of introductions. And of course, um, it's not about me, it's about the Alliance, it's about the work we're all doing together and the substance of what we're trying to accomplish here. And I, I think we've heard from Dr. Tedros already some of the statistics and from Kate. Um, 2021 was the year with the greatest number of vaccine introductions in a single year. And we really have to remember that because it's an extraordinary accomplishment by resilient health systems across the world. And it shows the power of investing in those systems and the roles they can play in a health emergency. Of course, at the same time, 25 million children were un or under vaccinated and, um, you know, 18 million of those received no doses at all. So I think what we're seeing now is, in a sense, that that old uh, saying of the best of times and the worst of times, we really need now to concentrate back. And that's what the big catch up is about. And, and this is across all the partners in the immunization community, all the partners of the Gavi Alliance, but also countries um, and um, civil society, industry, and others to keep trying now to um, uh, recommit to um, strengthening routine immunization and protecting the future of younger generations. Um, I have to say that, um, you know, as part of this, and I want to make the argument for it, immunization, for every dollar we invest, we get a $54 return if you take into account the full effects of, of immunization. And, and, and this is, there's nothing else like it. And so from, from our perspective, certainly, and I understand I'm an advocate, what we need is a situation where there is uh, attention to this in every country that we focus in on this as the most cost-effective intervention. And of course, prevention is, is better than treatment and, it, and in a sense is the building of universal health coverage because if we have outbreaks of disease, we will never be able to get there. What we need to do is prevent all of these infections so that we can strengthen the system um, across that. And, and um, you know, obviously, Kate's talked about the 50th anniversary of of uh, the, the EPI program. Um, when it started, there was less than 5% coverage of vaccine in the world, only six diseases being covered at that time. And today, WHO has 11 vaccines that are recommended to every child. And, and so we've really moved far. And before the pandemic, we had gotten to a level of about 90% of coverage um, in the routine system and about 82% in the, um, uh, the tracer vaccine that WHO uses DPT3. Thank you. Um, thank you. I think we will circle back in terms of questions and there'll be an opportunity to ask some questions. Um, but I want to uh, give the floor to um, Dr. Uda Farah, um, Family Health Advisor at the Federal Ministry of health in Somalia to the federal government of Somalia, speaking on behalf of uh, His Excellency Dr. Ali Haji Adam Abubakar. Um, and to you, Dr. Uda, well, first, in a situation where you have a multiplicity of challenges, what are some of the accelerations or what are some of the gains that you have had uh, with immunization campaigns in Somalia? And what is the role of partners and funders in facilitating these campaigns and the wins. Uh, thank you so much, Rene. Uh, excellencies, distinguished delegates, colleagues, a very good evening. Uh, the WHO Pulse Survey, which Somalia participated, indicates a substantial disrupt disruption of essential health services during COVID pandemic. 
owing to this immunization, uh, disruption of immunization services, we are at risk of reversing our herd and gain. In 2020, 2022, our routine immunization coverage for Penta 3 has dropped between 10 to 15, while measles decreased 10 to 15. In 2022, uh, the government of Somalia have conducted more than 50, 10 acceleration campaigns to reach all his populations. With COVID vaccination, we have done 10 uh, acceleration campaigns, four national and subnational for polio vaccination to respond outbreak of the circulation vaccine derived polio type 2, and one national integrated polio measles and vitamin A2 to, to respond, and others like responding cholera outbreak in, in selected districts. Using all strategic possi possible, uh, fixed sites, outreach, mobile to reach, hard to reach area, nomadic, internal displacement, as well as marketplace, governmental uh, offices, and university. Over 7 million doses of COVID vaccine, vac uh, vaccine was ad administered to adults. Uh, 3.2 million children received measles vaccination, and over 10 million of, of oral polio vaccine were administered. Community participation was another key component to reach this target. The community at all its level, the local authority, community elderly, religious uh, group, women, youth were involved since the implementation, the preparation and planning and the implementation of the campaigns. Effective communication began with listening and understanding to key targets and risk communication and community engagement was done massively uh, massive communication, community engagement, house to house, uh, megaphones, TV, radio shows, SMS, ring phone calls, community committee meetings, uh, religious elder group, and information education material were distributed across the country. We appreciate really our technical uh, partners, WHO, Imprimis, and UNICEF for their technical support in these campaigns, the implementation and, uh, and planning. Without them, it wasn't possible. We also use the polio network, which is huge, uh, um, give us a, a really a access to hard to reach area in particular. We are thankful also our government partners, development partners, Gavi, COVAX facility, World Bank, other donors for, for their support, generous financial contribution. As we said, routine coverage, uh, routine organization coverage is really low in Somalia. Uh, only um, part, only um, six, 52 health facilities deliver immunization services. Particular, particular immunization infrastructure, particular change we have immunization services, infrastructures compounded by uh, human, uh, human resource, also limited for an accessible area security issue. Only 60% of these children eligible age group have access to basic immunization services. This is an urgent, especially in nomadic and rural people and IDPs with 46 uh, of our population. Despite this challenge, we, you, uh, we, you can witness how Somalia de did her best to reach 40% of coverage of COVID vaccination in 2022, while in 2021 our coverage was only less than 10%. It means that we reach in one year 30% of our population uh, with COVID vaccination. And also the number of childhood vaccine we have administered in a year, uh, besides all our conflicts, our humanitarian uh, emergencies can witness. We can do more if we have adequate funding. Only $7 is needed to, vac to fully vaccinate a child. Somalia will need support to expand its immunization services and also uh, human resources, including community health workers. I thank you and back to you, Mr. Chef. Thank you very much. And so to some success stories. Nepal is one of those. But what was the impact of Nepal of uh, COVID-19 on the delivery of vaccines in Nepal? And what strategies have you implemented to recover coverage to the 2019 data. I'll ask you Dr. Bakash Devkota, who is the additional Secretary, Ministry of Health and Population of the Government of Nepal, to speak to these and perhaps pointing us towards the future to some of the things that you believe need to be done by countries in order to get not just to the numbers that were at 2019, but beyond. 
The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I'm very much pleased and it's my honor to be here and share how Nepal succeed in achieving significant recovery from backsliding in immunization. Uh, in 2020, due to the pandemic, the routine immunization was decreased due to continued efforts of the national immunization program. This was recovered in the same year later. In the WHO UNICEF estimates data released on 15th July 2022, Nepal is among the 39 countries globally which managed an improvement in vaccine coverage in 2021 as compared to 2020. During nationwide lockdown, Nepal conducted MR campaign with the coverage of 84%. Further, during the pandemic period, Nepal was one of the countries to introduce two new vaccines, rotavirus and typhoid vaccine. Moreover, it was done along with integration of hygiene promotion into routine vaccine. That was exemplary in Nepal. We also conducted two nationwide vaccination campaign, AMR follow-up campaign and TCV catch-up campaign. In current, this fiscal year, annualized TCV coverage for eight months is already 91%. During the period, Nepal also had significant progress in COVID-19 vaccination coverage with primary series of full vaccination. Current coverage among total population is 83%. This is one of the highest coverage in our region. Now I want to share and focus on strategy that have been implemented to recover coverage levels to 2019, 2019 data. The V-shaped bounce back was made to improve routine immunization coverage. A sharp dip down was seen immediately after lockdown following the pandemic. After government approaches, coverage is improved and returned to pre-pandemic level rapidly within few months, in three months actually. Here I want to highlight some major interventions we did to increase those coverage. Apart from Minister of Health and Population, joint effort was made by all stakeholders to enhance and strengthen routine immunization coverage. It is very important and it solved very good coordination among all concerns to increase the vaccine coverage. Policy barrier of childhood routine vaccination up to two years was lifted with routine vaccination and now it is given up to five years or five years of age. We linked MR SIA to RI routine immunization and routine immunization to MR SIA to find missed children, identifying those in vaccination campaign, vitamin A campaign program, IM NCI program and other public health program which are conducted in our country. And those were followed up and ensured full immunization is received by every child. Social and behavior change communication strategy was adopted to increase demand for routine immunization and strengthen community engagement. Furthermore, we in health management inf information system, the HMIS data analysis and tracking of immunization coverage was done to get information from each of local levels so that we can find the unreached and get to them. An independent immunization monitoring system was established which check and report under immunized persons in the community. A big catch up with search and immunize campaign was started. For this collaboration was done with local municipalities and other line ministries for the better governance. Two additional nationwide vaccination days were included in April, especially for vaccinating missed children besides the regular fixed and out outage vaccination sessions. And also the school vaccination card check for children below five years was initiated to ensure each of our children got full immunization. Reflecting lessons in routine and pandemic 
period on vaccination, Nepal is currently developing its national immunization strategy for next seven years and strengthening routine immunization with focus on zero dose and under immunized children. I thank WHO and other agencies for their support in immunization and would like to express commitment on the behalf of my government to make our achievement sustained and even do more. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Prakash. I want to um, spare as much time as I possibly can so that I ensure that you have an opportunity to um, ask as many questions as you would like to. And so let's hear from those who are at the front line, those who are in the remote parts of the world, those who are with the communities, starting off with you, Dr. Yasin Cholokov. As a health worker in Canada, speak not only to some of the examples uh, that have been deployed to improve access, but also how do you build trust and culturally tailored services that improve effectiveness in immunization services in a world where social media tells us perhaps that immunization might defertilize or that it might be the mark of the beast. And while we might smile here in this room, we know there are communities that will not take vaccines because they fall belief to this. Dr. Yassin, ah, there you are. Thank you. <clears throat> no one is safe until everyone is safe. We've heard this sentence plenty of times during the pandemic and it remains true, although the scope of it is maybe should be interpreted broad, more broadly. Equity is often treated as the bells and whistles. Uh, sorry to the interpreters, maybe a less idiomatic way of saying this would be equity is often considered as an extra option, something fun to have rather than a key determinant of the effectiveness of our public health interventions. It's actually more like the tires on a car. It doesn't matter how powerful the engine, how fancy the brand, without the tires, we're not moving forward. A, friends, a phrase that we've often heard said in these halls is what gets measured gets done. In order to act on equity, we must get disaggregated data to identify the places, the groups, the communities, where different or more intensive public health interventions should be deployed. And we must have community intelligence to understand how to interpret those data. Averages lie. We must heed public health decisions that are solely based on large group averages. It makes us oversee the critical intervention loci for public health. Looking at the average usually provides a false sense of reassurance for all kinds of diseases including communicable pathogens that can be prevented by immunization, but also uh, socially communicable diseases or NCDs that also transmit through very similar social networks as infectious diseases. This being said, uh, the falling global average immunization uh, rate is rightfully an alarm bell, uh, but it, the priority is not only to get that average back on track and even above what we previously had, uh, but also to deploy interventions that will target the farthest uh, groups, those who are hardest to reach. Uh, when we talk about immunization, this, the example of zero dose children is a good one, but there are many other uh, populations that, are, that, that we should be focusing on. So I have underlined that equity is key for the effectiveness of interventions, but how do we address it beyond measuring? I think trust is the linchpin of many a public health intervention. It, it's the thing that, um, it, it, one of the best ways of understanding it is, is to try to look at where things are most difficult. So to explore trust, we must look where trust is most absent or least present. I work in uh, northern regions of Canada, one mostly inhabited by indigenous people, Inuit. This region is starkly scarred by colonialism, still suffering from the impacts of systemic racism and the people there are distrustful. They're distrustful of all kinds of structures of authority, and rightfully so because of their history. The participation in public health programs requires trust. Um, the recent COVID pandemic has shown us that, and, and has also shown us how we can use some of the learning uh, points from it to better improve other programs. So during the pandemic, we deployed many interventions extremely quickly, had to do uh, rapid and agile public decision making. And we've done that by getting closer to the communities and engaging them much more than we, ha we had before. These are learnings that we can bring back. Um, 
as a side note, I think that when we think about communities and who to engage in them, we have to think more broadly than the leadership, the elected officials or religious leaders or whoever has power formally recognized. There's all kinds of forms of leaderships in communities, informal, uh, informal leadership, people that have a lot of clout that are recognized but do not have a formal title and those are also individuals to engage because that's the way to reach the population. So as I was saying, during the COVID pandemic, we worked closely with those communities and we had problems other than COVID. We had one of the largest outbreak of a vaccine preventable disease and using those networks, we managed to respond and to deploy interventions that we would have had much harder time to deploy otherwise. We engaged uh, the population, deployed interventions adapted to what they wanted in each different in each community according to the desires of the people that were there. And these are things that we must now continue and reuse and expand in order to catch back on, uh, on immunization and maybe to expand immunization with, with uh, uh, new vaccines that are coming up. The difference is very stark. When applying an intervention that comes from the top down and has, does not have community support, tremendous amounts of effort are, are, have to be deployed and it's not a cost effective use of the resources. When deploying things that are locally adjusted and have the support of the community, usually things go much better than we ex even expect and with much less efforts on our side. So I'm probably coming at the end of my time. So very briefly, don't forget the often forgotten, averages lie and trust is an essential public health tool. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yassin. And thank you for speaking of your experience. Well, let's continue that conversation with populations at community health level. So Dr. George uh, Munya, community health worker in Ghana, let's take it on from uh, what Dr. Yassin has said. What is the impact and what, actually what is the impact of the spread of misinformation in social media, uh, but elsewhere also amongst communities in the uptake of vaccines and Here's the real question in the room is, how do you counter that misinformation and get out the correct information? And since we're discussing social media, the hashtag is vaccines work. I'm quite sure that all of you will be on Twitter or elsewhere talking about the conference today. <laughs> to you, Dr. George. Thank you, Renee. So first of all, I just want to express my biggest gratitude to the leadership of this round and specifically to Dr. Kate O'Brien for making sure the voice of the least respected, the least recognized and the least appreciated who is the bedrock of health and universal health is recognized and is represented on this table. First of all, the concept of trust and how do we get to that and how do we counter misinformation? I think the first most important thing to recognize is that in the making of decisions on the global stage, please and please make sure we have good representation from the communities and from community health workers who live close to and live with the very problems we intend to address. Uh, the first thing in my experience as a community health worker, more often we are amazed at the recommendation and interventions that come down to us to deliver to the people we live with. Because you can tell when we see those guidelines and, and instructions that where they were developed, they have no clue on the realities on the ground. And that is the first thing, and always suggesting this idea of global level Planning and policies and interventions does not incorporate and involve communities and community health workers. So that is the first place to establish trash, trust. Then the second point is when we are invited for programs, create an environment where we can speak honestly to truth without punishment. There are many instances where I have been invited to programs Sometimes the very people who are part of the problem are sitting next to me and I'm being questioned to share my views honestly. And I will share that after that you get up and get in the car and go, I live with that supervisor. The supervisor who will take 60% of my salary is sitting next to me and you are asking me what are your problems. <laughs> the healthcare provider 
who is telling the woman that your child is dirty? Who is charging women for immunization? Is sitting next to the community member and you are asking the community people, what are your challenges? So again, when we are invited, it should be in a safe environment where we can share truth that will really change things. Then the last piece, when we share our views, don't give empty promises that they will be taken into consideration. When the ideas are developed and brought back to the community, you cannot find a trace of the views that communities share. Communities and community health workers are always the last to be considered in global policy and decision making and the first to be called upon when programs are failing and falling short. And we need to change that. If we want to achieve universal health, if we want to reach the under-immunized and zero-dose children in communities, if we want no child, no family, and no communities to be left behind, let's listen to community health workers and communities. And let's act on what we hear in sincerity. With that, I tell you, the fancy maps, heat maps that shows zero-dose communities, we communities and community health workers know where the zero-dose children are. We don't need maps to show us the houses of people we live with. And I believe strongly, and I'm so again grateful for this rare opportunity that the voices of grassroots will be heard today in such a room and with people, the caliber of people we have in this room. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. George. And uh, I could see the um, uh, family health advisor from uh, Somalia, Dr. Uda, smiling and nodding vigorously. And I'm quite sure she'll have something to say about that. Let's talk a little bit about this table and who should be invited to speak on it. Uh, whenever we speak about you know, expanding the table or inviting people to the table, we're usually dealing with gender or gender issues. And very often when we refer to gender barriers, we're talking about women. But is that the only barrier? Are those the only ones we should be thinking about? In fact, even as we define gender, who are we not defining? In Kenya, where I come from, the last census will show you that we have now introduced a third gender, recognizing that we are born male, female, or intersex. So what's the impact of gender on the delivery of <coughs> immunization services? And how do we make sure that gender-inclusive immunization services are built, that perhaps we stop talking at tables and sit in barazas. I don't know. Dr. Sheetal Sharma, CSO representative, perhaps you could let us know what your views are. Good afternoon. Um, vaccines don't deliver themselves, no. It takes community health workers, it takes a mother, it takes a female community health worker in over 70% of the world. So when we're speaking about equity, where are women in this equation? Where are the women who are the community health workers who are not remunerated because they're volunteers and there's a prestige in volunteering? But surely if they're doing immunization along with other primary healthcare services, including nutrition and wash, where is the remuneration, where's respect for the role? So I agree with what George has said. How are we formalizing community health workers into the system and more importantly, women in the system. Um, the other point I also want to make that, yes, Renee, gender is a spectrum. It's not just women. They are marginalized populations, unvaccinated populations who should be part of the health system, the primary health care system and immunization services who are left behind, who are shamed, who are not included. So there's a number of missing populations that we're not addressing. Again, I want to bring it back to women because it's women having these children. It's women coming to these very remote parts and the, the health centers closed. The immunizations, are, the vaccines are not available. The services, the cold chain is not functional. And I want us to also maybe think about categorization. In zero dose, in under immunized, the environment, the ecosystem has much more challenges that we have to address. We cannot put together zero dose communities with under immunized as part of RI catch up. It's a different set of populations. 
I also want to talk about Gavi's Zero Dose Initiative program that has happened under Dr. Berkeley's time, that it was a huge investment made to catch, to catch up children, to immunize children in hard to reach conflict settings. How are we going to do it? How are we going to really realistically talk about equity when the majority of these people are too afraid to come to health services for fear of their life? And also, when we're talking about community health workers, immunization uh, officers, we're sending them into these areas without a lot of security. And some of the targets are only up to a year, one year old, two years old. Yet we're negotiating. Look at the case of Somalia or, or even of Sudan. We're sending out these officers, these teams who go immunize, yet we're cutting it off at a target of one year old or two years old when we should be vaccinating up to five. Um, the Director General of WHO has spoken this week also about introduction of the HPV vaccine. HPV vaccine is it's affecting girls, young girls and women. Yet how are we, when we're speaking about equity, how are we bringing these conversations forward? I have spoken you know, in my i 20 conversations that the pandemic set many gender priorities backwards. So how at the local level, the national, the global level, are we really talking about these global policies that are designed where the countries can take ownership, that it's not a top-down approach, how are we really ensuring leadership, whether it comes to Gavi Alliance applications with the countries, and I'm pleased to say that, you know, there is a, a gender component in the recent applications that uh, Dr. Berkeley and his team are leading on. I think also this work has to be approached with humility. We don't know what we don't know. The uh, Amartya Sen, over two decades ago, wrote about 100 million missing girls. We are speaking about 25 missing children. How many of them are girls? Women, the communities they're in, are penalized for not bringing, for not, for, for not bringing male children for immunization services. Who is asking about the missing girls? I want to end as well on, we're expecting now in, you know, the, in our PPR discussions, in pandemic preparedness discussions, we want the community to be involved in surveillance. Where are the women in this conversation? We have to start speaking about equity and gender in the same voice. So I think my challenge, my parting shot to people today is when you will return, when you speak about equity and reaching every child, are you really thinking about the girls, the women, and the other genders in the room? Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shital, for expanding the kind of thinking that we should be doing. Well, there are some strategies that have been employed by governments to implement and to recover immunization services and cap catch up on those that we're talking about that you've mentioned, uh, Shital, and earlier on, George, and of course, others here, the missing children. So to you, uh, Mr. Andre Kazaku, the question is, what strategies did your government, the Moldovian government, implement to recover immunization services? Speaking from your vantage point as the head of external assistance coordination service, foreign assistance department in the Ministry of Health in Moldova, what are some of your insights? Thank you, Irina. Your Excellency Director General, distinguished delegates, dear colleagues, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a significant impact on the delivery of immunization in the Republic of Moldova. The state of emergency of the first month with prioritization of resources, including healthcare personnel, equipment and facilities towards the response to COVID-19 pandemic has strained the existing healthcare system and disrupted the delivery of routine immunization services for more than one and a half months. The implementation of infection prevention and control measures have further contributed to the challenges in maintaining routine immunization services during the pandemic and made difficult implementation of a catch-up campaign. In August 2020, the Ministry of Health, with the support of WHO, launched the nationwide immunization communication campaign for routine vaccines and catch-up of those unvaccinated. In 2019, DTP-free vaccination coverage was 91% for one-year-old age children, comparing with 2020, when we reached only 86.6%. As a result, 
where was a decline in immunization coverage rates in Moldova during the pandemic. Many children and adults have missed out on receiving essential vaccines, leaving them vulnerable to vaccine-preventable diseases. In the recent year, years, every year, approximately, approximately five year, uh, 5,000 one-year-old children miss out being vaccinated according to national immunization program. The COVID-19 pandemic has also had an impact on public confidence in vaccines in Moldova. Misinformation surrounding COVID-19 vaccines and vaccines in general have emerged during the pandemic. Rebuilding and maintaining public trust in vaccines is crucial for the success of routine immunization programs and the overall control of preventable diseases. In response to these challenges, the Minister of Health of the Republic of Moldova has taken several measures. We have implemented strategies to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 vaccine deployment and hesitancy related to receiving COVID-19 vaccines on routine immunization, such as ensuring availability of vaccines, adapting vaccination schedules, and implementing catch-up campaigns to reach to those who missed their vaccinations. Efforts have been made to communicate accurate and reliable information about vaccines, addressing concerns and misconceptions by infodemic management, and promoting their importance in preventing diseases and protecting public health. Uh, Moldova implemented also targeted actions to recover immunization services and catch up missing children. Firstly, I would like to highlight a significant achievement in our recent immunization campaign carried out to scale up COVID-19 vaccine and catch up with the children who missed their doses during the COVID-19 pandemic. This was done in collaboration with the local public authorities and implemented with the support of WHO and European Union. This campaign was aimed to intensify the immunization service delivery in 10 target districts. The results were remarkable. We observed 1.4-fold increase in COVID-19 DTP and MMR vaccination coverage in targeted districts. The success was possible due to the involvement of more than 1,000 official and non-official leaders in 10 administrative territories. They were trained and actively participated in the development and implementation of action plans to increase vaccination coverage. Furthermore, evidence-based messages regarding the importance of vaccinations and risk of preventable diseases were effectively delivered. This intervention has been truly a bottom-up which demonstrated effective coordination efforts, both the national and sub-national stakeholders in improving vaccination coverage in targeted areas. Another achievement of this initiative was the engagement of community health workers to achieve immunization target, targets. This approach has been one of the best practices of the Republic of Moldova in engaging communities in immunization programs and strengthening our health systems from the bottom up. We are proud to announce that this successful model will be extended to all districts, ensuring that no one is left behind through building local health coalitions. Additionally, our commitment to providing equitable health services to all communities, including those who may be marginalized or disadvantaged, is evident in our efforts to provide immunization services for refugees from Ukraine. From the first day of the war in Ukraine, we adjusted our immunization services to cater to the needs of the refugees offering vaccines free of charge. Thousands of children and adults have been vaccinated against polio, measles, COVID-19, and flu, demonstrating our dedication to ensuring that every individual, regardless of their background, has non-discriminatory access to healthcare services. The immunization catch-up campaign was done based on a national risk assessment developed by WHO and the Ministry of Health. Lastly, I would like to highlight the approval of our national immunization program for 2023-2027. This program aligns with the European Immunization Agenda 2030, reinforcing our commitment to achieve regional and global immunization goals and it lays the foundation for our future generations and serves as a roadmap for further improving immunization coverage and services in the Republic of Moldova. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. And as we let Dr. Tedros um, attend to a matter that is before him, I want to um, I want to circle back to you, Dr. Seth. There are a number of questions which I think are sitting on the floor and where we'd like to tap of your wisdom. One is the role, of course, of Gavi, which you spoke to. But more than that is the role of immunization in pandemic preparedness. Gavi, UNICEF, CPI, WHO played a very important part in the delivery of the vaccine through COVAX. What are some of the lessons learned? And as a bonus question, if you do have time, you're known for loving data and innovation. What do we need to do going forward? So thank you for those questions. And, and let me just start by saying what an amazing panel. We went all the way from the grassroots across different countries, across different regions, and this is what makes immunization the most widely distributed intervention in the world. And so I think we need to applaud everybody here for the work that they are doing. So. So since I won't get to speak a lot uh, more on these topics, I do want to um, just start off and say something about the Alliance, because it has been an extraordinary partnership. You need partners. You need to work together. And that's what we've done. And so if we look at the timing over, uh, Gavi's been around for 23 years, working with our partners, we've been able to protect a whole generation of children now, more than one billion unique children in 77 countries. But on, t <laughs> on top of that, 1.4 billion doses of campaign vaccines, and on top of that, 2 billion doses from COVAX. So this has been a partnership that has made a difference. But of course, those numbers aren't what mattered. We've already talked about the coverage increases that have occurred. New vaccines, we have two cancer vaccines now against liver cancer and cervical cancer. And th th this partnership has introduced, working with countries, over 600 new vaccines. Um, this has contributed to a 70% reduction in vaccine-preventable disease deaths, and, and that, of course, has contributed to a 50, uh, more than 50% reduction in under-five child mortality. This is what it's all about. The, thing, the other thing that's critical is countries pay for their vaccines. They pay a little when they're first entering and, and have a very low uh, resources, and over time they pay more until they graduate. 19 countries have graduated out. And the reason they can do that is we've seen over a 90% reduction in the cost of vaccines by working together to buy. So that's what the partnership has brought to the table. The specific question you asked is, you know, what happened, um, you know, with the pandemic? So when we knew the previous pandemic of flu had a, um, basically no vaccines got to developing countries, so we started to try to build COVAX. And um, this, in a sense, was the best of the partnership again. Um, we had vaccines in developing countries 39 days after the first injection outside. And, and as I said, the previous time was zero. So this is an extraordinary accomplishment. You all know the roadblocks we hit, vaccine nationalism, issues related to export bans and other activities. But at the end, each one of these was dealt with and overcame. And today, um, and I do understand the tyrannies of averages, but um, coverage rates are 55% of primary vaccine in the 92 poorest countries. And more importantly, in healthcare workers, 82% and in elderly, 69%. And we've already heard from Somalia the extraordinary um, uh, ability they had to go up to 40% coverage. But at the end of, uh, the beginning of 2022, we had 34 countries with less than 10%. Again, the partnership came together. And today, that's down to six countries, five of whom are fragile. So we've seen the power of partnership work on these activities. Now, what are the lessons learned from uh, this. First of all, it is really critical that, you know, we work together. That's obviously at the beginning. The second thing is the, the you already heard from numerous people, and I mentioned it already, that it's the resilient health system that delivered more than three times the vaccines ever given before in 2022. And so, yes, coverage dropped by about 5%, but 
the health system actually delivered all these vaccines. And so we have to be very proud of what's been accomplished. But we need to strengthen those resilient health, health systems. We have to reach the zero-dose children. We have to do the planning at, at low levels that are necessary to move this forward. The other thing we learned is we need um, uh, funding available on day zero. This is critical because, of course, Donors were incredibly generous. We ended up raising $12.5 billion over the course of, a, of about a year, but we were behind other countries in the queue. So having that money available at the beginning is critical. And lastly, I think what's really important is this issue of taking risk. Traditionally, development, you know, uh, the field is risk averse. And in this case, what we had to do is get agreement, which we got, to go ahead and buy vaccines at risk. We ultimately bought, I think the number was around three and a half billion doses at risk and um, uh, delivered two billion of those to 146 countries. But the point there is we have to make sure that when a pandemic occurs, we have the ability to take this type of risk. Your last question was um, about my loving data and um, innovation, what's needed going forward. I think we're entering an amazing renaissance right now in vaccines, partially because of COVID. There has been an incredible investment. There were over 200 vaccines that were moving forward, new technologies, and these are going to open up possibilities for many diseases, cancer, for chronic diseases, even for processes such as aging. So what we need to do is make sure that we have technology moving forward, but then also what we need to do is make sure that we have the data to understand who's getting vaccines. And, and we've already heard on the panel the need to move away from the averages down to subnational data to take advantage of digital innovation and, and identity so that we can track where we are. And, and those will lead to enormous advances. During the pandemic, we had already put in 66,000 new units of cold chain, mostly solar, to help countries with their cold chain problems, but then we needed ultra cold chain and we had to pivot and do that. These innovations are critical and building those systems, having those tools will ultimately what's gonna lead to the next um, you know, generation of interventions on vaccines. And so I'm very optimistic we will catch up. I'm very optimistic that we will make sure that vaccines are not just for under one year of age, but for all those who need them. We're now going to a life course of vaccines, which is going to be important. And then I see, I see vaccinology as being a solution for many of the big problems. We have malaria vaccines, TB vaccines are coming. Of course, I hope someday for HIV, vaccines for group B strep, for RSV. It's really going to be an interesting time, but we can't do that without the systems, the healthcare workers, the policies, and that's what this whole panel has been about. So thank you. Dr. Seth, all that is unsaid in the room is that we're not going to let you go with all of that knowledge just yet. We're going to figure out a way to keep you. I want to uh, open this now to the floor and uh, to invite some comments. Uh, allow me to start uh, with you um, from uh, WHO um, AFRO, the Africa Regional Law Office, Dr. Joseph Kobore, and then uh, after that to uh, Dr. Eleanor. But first to you, Dr. Joseph, please go ahead. I will speak in French. Just a few minutes just to have your headsets. Madame la moderatrice, la Thank you, moderator. The African region attaches top priority to the issue of children um, who have received not a single dose, but also um, children who haven't had enough about 7.7 .7 million uh, children who are under-vaccinated. And vaccination is no luxury, it's no option, it's uh, an obligation, it's a duty that we all share. We need to take every single effort possible to identify uh, where these children live, strengthen the strategies that have shown to be effective. Um. What is the channel for English? I can see that some of our panelists are not. See, it's channel two. Thank you so much. Should I proceed? Uh, Allez-y. Merci, Merci. beaucoup. 
please go ahead. I was saying that we have a duty to vaccinate these children. It's no option or luxury. Um, it's a duty that uh, is incumbent upon all of us. We need to spare no effort in identifying why these ch where these children live and identify strategies that have shown to be effective in the field, um, focusing on uh, communities, primary health care infrastructure uh, to plan and reach uh, these children. Sometimes children live very close to cities, in the outskirts of large cities, but also in the hamlets, the villages, in the nomad, uh, nomadic camps or in uh, uh, border regions. But wherever these undervaccinated children are, we need to do everything we can to reach them. The African Regional Office um, is focusing on uh, producing scientific data in order to guide our planning processes. We support the 14 priority countries in particular uh, in terms of uh, uh, monitoring the implementation of their rollout uh, vaccination campaigns um, in order to benefit these children. Technological innovations must also be used in order to use a, a geo-localization uh, uh, to reach those uh, zero-dose or undervaccinated children. With regard to the program for introducing the malaria vaccine, which has also been referred to, more than 1.5 million children were vaccinated in Ghana, Kenya, and Malawi. And we've seen a significant reduction in the serious cases of malaria and hospitalization and indeed deaths. And this is an opportunity for us to thank uh, those uh, who've been involved in these partnerships, Gavi and other partners. There is such a demand now for that uh, malaria vaccine um, that there is more demand than supply exists. We also pay tribute to the key role of the African Forum for Vaccine Regulation um, and uh, WHO AFRO is the secretariat for that with the support, uh, giving support to national authorities. Moderator, the best gift that we could give to our children as we celebrate the 75th anniversary of the WHO would be to ensure that every child receives the vaccination that they need. Thank you. That's very well said. The best gift that we could give to our future, to our children. Um, I want to invite uh, Dr. Eleanor Nwadinobi, representing the Immunization Agenda 2030 Partnership Council, to uh, say a few words, followed by a representative from Canada and World Bank. Please go ahead, madam. Thanks very much indeed, madam uh, moderator. In my Igbo language, there is a proverb that says, the elders do not sit and watch the she-goat tied to a tether whilst in labor. In the same way, we all have to purposefully, strategically, and intentionally untie the she-goat of immunization delivery. And how do we do that? I fully agree with you, Rene. We have to expand the constituency, expand the community of practice to include the unfamiliar voices from the communities right up to the health system leaders, what I call as a musician myself, the accordion effect. You push from up and you push from down for it to work. We need to engage purposefully with parliamentarians. As Dr. George so eloquently said, the community health workers, and that should include the custodians of culture Yes, gender is important. We are male, female, and other, but we are one humanity. So I have a recipe for the three C's, and that's to one, 
co-create, which means, as Dr. George has said, involve those for whom the interventions are important. Then we have to contextualize. We have to communicate. Let's have consistent messaging. I wear a hat as the international president of the Medical Women's International Association. And what we have found is that as healthcare frontliners, and I heard this morning also, that a lot of our colleagues themselves need to have their capacities built within the healthcare system regarding immunization. But what we do is to break down the highfalutin language to make it simple for those in the communities to understand. And it's through pictures and it's making sure that right down to the dialects that our people understand the good of vaccines. As I round up, it's important to talk about the importance of HPV. And part of that consistent messaging means that because there's a narrative that is sometimes rejected by communities, there are strategic ways around it. And very quickly, for example, using the language of waiting for sexual debut may be rejected by communities. However, if you focus instead on cancer risk and life-saving that HPV brings, then the community is more likely to be accepting of it. Women take a lot of decisions in the homesteads at household level. However, the decision-making at household level is inextricably linked to the kind of violence that women suffer in the households. And that in itself is a barrier to the decisions that women make at household level. So let's look at populations in their entire vulnerabilities. Thank you. Thank you for bringing in the intersectionality of disease prevention, vaccine immunization, and life, particularly with that remark on violence and decision making. I want to invite a um, representative from Canada and then from the World Bank. I have three minutes between the two of you. I'm not very sure how it's going to work out, but I can see already from the collegiality that one of you is suggesting they'll take one and give the other two minutes to the other. So <laughs> over to you. Good afternoon and thank you very much. I promise to be as quick as I can be to give my colleague a bit of time. Uh, a few reflections from Canada. Canada is deeply concerned uh, about the global disruptions to essential health services and routine immunization. Canada remains committed to strengthening health systems and pandemic prevention, preparedness and response, as well as to vaccine manufacturing capacity in low and lower middle income countries as part of an inclusive and sustainable strategy from COVID-19. This includes through Canada's signature Global Initiative for Vaccine Equity, CanGive, which aims to reinforce health system capacity and diversify vaccine manufacturing capacity in 12 targeted countries, mainly in Africa. I wanted to take the opportunity to share a few views and reflections from Canada's experience on the importance of both upstream and downstream initiatives. Firstly, it is critical to ensure community health workers are supported, trained, compensated, and integrated into the health workforce. They hold important trust building and connector roles between health system and the communities, which is paramount for advancing immunization efforts. And we've heard that across the board this afternoon, whether it be in Ghana, whether it be in Somalia, and indeed in Northern Canada. 
the trust factor. Secondly, community uh, engagement must take place before, during, and after emergencies, particularly in order to overcome the unique barriers to immunization faced by marginalized groups, and we've heard that a lot today as well. Those that are gender and, and rights related more broadly. Um, close collaboration and community-led responses with community groups and leaders, such as women's rights organizations, traditional and faith-based leaders, is essential. And thirdly, Canada recognizes the importance of working in partnership, and we heard that resoundingly from Dr. Berkeley, um, further upstream as well. That is why we're working with Gavi, indeed with UNICEF, WHO, to ensure that investment in immunization, catch-up campaigns, core health system support, and innovative ways to bring immunization services to displaced or difficult communities is, um, is done. It's also why we continue to support the work of organizations like CEPI to reduce the time required to develop vaccines and new and emerging infectious disease threats against new and emerging uh, infectious disease threats. So this includes making sure research development and manufacturing enables access to all people in need. Ultimately, and above all, we must not delay, as has been said so much today. Now is the time we've got to double down on routine childhood immunization and turn the ship around the big catch up. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. I hope I've left you a minute. Thank you very much indeed. Go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Rene, and honorable speakers and participants. The World Bank commends WHO member states on their tremendous effort to deploy C-19 vaccines, while at the same time, in many cases, struggling to maintain routine immunization and health services. We strongly support the WHO-led effort to catch up, restore, and recover routine immunization after COVID-19 disruptions. The coming months, though, and years will bring increasing financing challenges to immunization programs in many low- and lower-middle-income countries, due in part to constrained or shrinking health budgets. Strong country leadership will be required to prioritize and protect health and immunization budgets. The World Bank will continue to work with WHO and Gavi Alliance partners to provide support for country processes and capacities for prioritization both within immunization programs and more broadly in the health sector. Finally, the World Bank will continue to work with WHO and the Gavi Alliance partners in order to support countries that are transitioning from donor support, recognizing that data, analytics, capacity building, and close collaboration among partners is particularly important for these countries. Thank you. Indeed, thank you very much. Uh, we're coming to the end of this round table, but I want to do something uh, to surprise, I think, two people. Number one, it is to invite Dr. Kate O'Brien, first surprise, to give a short tribute and a celebration of Dr. Seth Berkeley, as we celebrate him before we conclude, after which I will ask you, in honor of the work that he has done, to join me in giving him a standing ovation second surprise, in recognition of the leadership of Gavi over the years. Dr. Kate, to you. Yes, please. Uh, thanks so much, Renee. And this is a complete surprise and a, a very, very welcome one. So I have to say, when, uh, when you, you say something like that, I think, oh my goodness, where, what am I getting myself in for right now? But this one is super easy. Um, so Seth. Uh, First of all, Seth, you've been the CEO of the Gavi Alliance for 12 years, and it has been 12 absolutely remarkable years of progress, of innovation, of achievement. Um, and you've been a leader of the Alliance in a way that has really brought partners across so many sectors together to achieve what I think most people couldn't have imagined would have been achieved. So I really want to honor you for your energy, for your passion for this work, for your just you know, without fatigue, uh, you have been on this every day of every week of every year for 12 years. 
and we will be the poorer for you moving on to some new endeavors, which we're very interested to hear what those will be. But I think there's not a person in this room who has not been touched, or their family has been touched, or their family of their family has been touched by the work that you have done in Gavi as the Secretariat through supporting the Alliance. So we are going to miss you terribly in this role. We also know that you're handing over to Mohamed Pate, who is an incredible leader, who has very big shoes to fill. And we want to just express the incredible gratitude we have for everything that you've done. Seth, cheers to you. I will invite Dr. Bikash to stop cutting onions on the side so that uh, <laughs> Dr. Seth can stop uh, having to manage it. <laughs> and uh, for our concluding remarks, with great thanks to everyone on the panel for really facing the future and asking and endeavoring to answer the question, how do we ensure a safer and a healthier tomorrow? by catching up on routine immunization today. I want to thank you personally for your remarks and um, to invite, to make the concluding remarks, Dr. Bruce Eilward, who is the Assistant Director General, Division of Universal Health Coverage and Life Course here at the WHO with my own personal thanks for your time and for your patience and for your focus on this question. Over to you, Dr. Bruce. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And you've been so gracious in thanking all of our speakers today. They've all had a big hand, but I don't think we've had a chance to appreciate your uh, incredible role in all of this. I do have to say, however, when, uh, when Renee here said that we're going to stand up and give Seth a standing ovation to recognize his time you know, here, I looked at the time and I thought, oh my gosh, it's 2.22, so much for the start of the assembly on time, because Seth, you've been such a giant and you've had, uh, you've had uh, certainly deserved an even longer ovation from all of us. Folks, um, I'm a little bit new to this role, and uh, imagine a lot of you have talked about your concern about immunization and where it's going, the challenge before us, but imagine if you uh, sat in my seat three weeks ago uh, when this woman we keep talking about, Kate O'Brien, walked in and sat down across from me and she said, uh, Bruce, welcome. We have 67 million children who have missed vaccination over the last two years. And I thought, great, what do we need to do? Well, we're going to catch up this year. Super, I hope you have a plan. And uh, you just heard it from uh, the people on this panel. And I just want to take the last minute to appreciate uh, having health workers with us, community workers with us, government with us, core uh, with us, and CES, CSOs and others. And of course, most importantly, all of you. Because we have that 67 million, when Kate mentioned it to me, I thought, I thought well, I'm just going to, uh, I could give up now or we could dig in and, uh, and try and, and, and tackle this. And I think when you hear the kind of conversation we've had over the last uh, hour, hour and a half, you really leave the room uh, recognizing as we head into the next 50 years of uh, immunization, they will indeed, like you say, uh, Seth, not just be the Renaissance era, but the golden era of immunization. We're going in with powerful new partnerships. We're going in with new solutions. We're going in with exciting new vaccines, such as those against malaria. We're going in with a whole new recognition of a need for a new approach, a new kind of social contract to this. And George, thanks so much for reminding us the communities know where the missed kids are, and if you want to reach them, you got to engage them and do it right. And I think we've heard also that the commitment from government is as high as it was, if not higher, back when we launched uh, EPI. So I uh, have little doubt that we've got the capacities to reach uh, those 67 million that we missed. But 
we were already missing some, right? So we're going to go beyond that. And that was a challenge I spoke of the other night, uh, Seth, because even with those, we're not counting some of the others that we normally would have, uh, would, would, would have reached. So folks, um, we have an emergency in front of us because remember also, 67 missed children means 67 million children at risk of dying of something that's completely preventable, one of those diseases. And if that doesn't bring urgency to the goal in front of us and the challenge in front of us, nothing will. So the clock is ticking. Act now. Uh, act uh, together, as we've heard across this panel, and, uh, and let's get the catch-up done and move beyond. Thank you. The world's been off track. 